I noticed Kevin Caban as a professional footballer, of course I did. Anybody who displays the passion, athleticism, will to win and technique for scoring or creating really good goals was bound to attract the attention of somebody who feels about football the way that I do. What tipped Kevin over into being an automatic invite to be a guest in a big interview was his excellence as a broadcaster. Basically, whenever you listen to Kevin, either on television or where I mostly listen to him, which is a news talk off the ball, you're going to enjoy it. You're going to know more about the situation that he's assessing. He's worthwhile. In this big interview, I think you're going to laugh at his escapades on the golf course. His advocacy for his daughter's well-being inspires me. The importance of his international career. The fact that some of what we saw as a footballer and some of what we're hearing as a broadcaster was formed by the fact that he and his family did not always have the economic well-being to count on having food on the table or electricity or gas. And the remedies he took to solve that tell you a lot about this interesting, reliable, fun, intelligent fella who's making such a strong name for himself in football broadcasting. Enjoy the big interview. It's there for you. And thanks for the fact that you're there for us. Welcome to this project that we love called The Big Interview. It's not an original title, but it is an original guest, Kim Caban. Not only a footballer that I admire, because we only invite people that one or other of us in the team fully admires. You qualify for that. Also, somebody who's been very generous to me in his fledgling broadcasting career. We bump into each other occasionally on the road, so you have my sympathies for that, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> what criteria have you got to reach to, uh, to get total admiration? Do you know, in the entire series, I can't remember ever having been asked a question by any of the guests. <laughs> And to start off with a beauty like that. <laughs> well, look, anybody who's listened to the big interview before and you've had to put up with a little piece of me knows that if I'm not outright odd, I'm in that environment. I'm idiosyncratic. And therefore, what makes me admire people is anybody in the world of football who tries to do things as I imagine I would if I'd had enough talent. I like honesty. I like fun. I like wit. I like creativity. I like intelligence. And the ones I've admired in, in your profession aren't necessarily people who have always lifted a big trophy yeah. or made millions because people say, we must have that guy. I do like football intelligence. I like people who are forthright. The players I watch need to have heart, but they also, without question, need to have creativity and ability. And you can already recognise yourself because with it, without any false humility, you, you demonstrated all of those things. And also, when we talk... On the radio, I hear somebody who's not bluffing about continental football. There are people uh-huh. in these environs who have told me, he's an obsessive, he'll watch anything. So maybe it's just because yeah. you're watching it rather than <laughs> rehearsing it. Yeah. But like, I, I do notice yeah. the difference between those who've learned two names about the latest Spanish team that's playing well to throw at me and those who are genuinely interested. And that feels to me like the, the conversations that we have. But when we're... When we're Sorry, do you have any more questions? No, no, that's it. No, no feel that, free. No, no, you've just made a point there that I thought that needed to be clarified. That's okay. all, so it's fine. All right, you have complete freedom to <laughs> clap and into me at any stage during this. <laughs> Correct me or tell me that I'm acting like a total idiot. No, no, if you, you, want, you no, can you crack on, you crack freedom. on, you're fine. So, hmm. talking about international football, you are something of a, a child prodigy. Um, you made your debut mm. for Ireland very young. Yeah. In Corpus Christi playing. Oh, yeah. Playing. <laughs> I didn't think you'd go there that, on that one. <laughs> playing <laughs> playing fields. Because, all right, listen, I'm sucking the juice out of answers you've previously given. Mm. In that, I won't tell your story, but it's established that simply because your accent remains Preston, even though you're living in Dublin, that's something I need yeah. to ask you about. When you, in the playground, were playing England v Ireland, you were an Irish team and you were representing your country. And it was a little bit fierce. Yeah. I want specific memories because every single person, male, female, all ages, has done that playground football. Yeah. Been obsessed by getting out. It's a tennis ball or it's rags or it's a f- stupid petal station ball that floats over. Or it's a decent leather ball. Yeah. We've all done it. I want specific memories of Corpus Christi and yeah. England v Ireland. Well, I think, I've, I mean, I've said it before as well. I, I'll say it to you now. Most of my, my mates, my true mates growing up, were all similar or exactly the same background to I had. Both parents Irish, brought up 
very much in, in an Irish household. So we went to the Catholic schools in Preston, essentially. I went to St. Gregory's Primary School, where Alan Kelly went to, actually, who, you know, he was one of the lads I used to look up to growing up. Gosh. When his dad moved over from Bray, when he was playing for Preston famously, the record appearance holder for Preston North End, Alan then followed his, his own dad's tradition and managed to get a, a great career at Preston himself. So he went to St. Gregory's as well. So that was something for me immediately when I started school. You know, I had my brother there ahead of me. Me and my brother were both football mad growing up. But you had Alan Kelly there who had gone on then to play, first of all, first team football for Preston, but then go beyond that and go and play international football. So he was someone then when I first started to develop, he was one that you looked up to straight away because I, I can get near that. That's the, what that's the immediately what maybe gets a hold of you from a football perspective. And as I said before, all my mates were all from Irish backgrounds. So we, we grew up watching Euro 88. We grew up watching Italian 90, supporting Ireland. That's how it was for us. And we used to have these games in England v Ireland at school. And you mentioned there the word ferocious. The, the one thing that sticks out in my mind, even when I talk to my mates now about them, Sometimes it was a nil-nil draw. <laughs> I mean, you don't, have a, you don't have a game of football in a schoolyard and it's nope. a nil-nil draw. Definitely that, not. Some of these games... There was fights, you know, we'd take these scraps to the following day when we went back out to play again. And they were great times, but the competitive nature of those games, I think, helped us as a school team because we were one of the best. We were the best in Lancashire at the time. We were the best in Preston easily by far. But we were also, because of how we played day to day, that competitive nature set in with us. That's what I think helped us all develop because four lads from my high school, we all signed professional terms at Preston. One year below us, David Lucas, who's now goalkeeper coach at Fleetwood Town, he was a year below us as well. So we had, we had so many excellent players that was coming through my year. But the reason I believe we all developed and we all become half decent in the game was because of those England v Island games that were being played at, at, at break time and at, at lunch time. So paint us a, a, a fuller picture. Corpus Christi. Yeah. Are you playing into the bike sheds? Are you playing on concrete? We were playing actually playing on the playing the fields. We're playing so on the grass. allowed in the grass. Yeah, rather than the grass, yeah. Full pitch. The, the one thing with our school was it was total inclusion and total letting us get on with things, letting us use the total facilities of the school. So they allowed us to play on, on across the actual the pitches that we would use for our uh, school games, which was great. So we'd probably have, a, there were around about eight to ten aside games. So we'd have... Seamus Murphy, I'll say the names to you, Declan Hanley, Thomas Taylor, Tommy's nephew of Dennis Taylor. You know, these are the lads who we would have had all, all on our side. Now, I guess you, I knew you were naming your side. John Callaghan, yeah, exactly. So this, I, this is my side. This when I my... had my first playground football fight, it was with Lindsay Reid Porky, <laughs> who was a bully and a thug. I remember we just rolled around in mud for about 45 minutes with that killer blow being struck. But I was deemed the winner and it sticks with me to this day. And Porky, if you're out there, round to you any time you want. <laughs> So who yeah. were you? Who were the fights with? Who, who was in the, the fight, England team? The fight was actually, it's a bit of an Irish sounding name, but Paul McMenemy. He was a lad who, he came and signed professional terms at Preston. Excellent footballer in himself. And yeah, we were the ones that ended up having this scrap. And we ended up having, we ended up arranging a fight that evening in the local park. We ended up like, because it, it boiled over, we were best mates. And we ended up having this fight. And I always remember, he, he got the old, well, the old headlock, whatever it would be. We're getting, we're having a bit of a scrap. We're probably knackered after 30 seconds. I, I believe fight. it used to be called a Gravison in, at Everton, didn't it? A Gravison, yeah, that's it. was a Gravison, yeah. You, you're not, yeah, you're obviously doing a lot of homework there. But he got, he got his fingers in my mouth and he was end up like getting, you know, the old wrenching of the mouth. And I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't bite down on him because he was pulling my cheeks apart. Anyway, it, we ended up breaking up and we become best mates again the following day, I think it was. That's would it be right. over a, 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 a tackle, tackle and offside? It, it, it would have been a tackle. tackle. It would always been a who tackle. Who went over the, the top? Get, who you, left you, a leg in? Again, you mentioned the word ferocious at the start. That was exactly how they were. Nothing held back in these games. Two-footed tackles, elbows flying. And it did actually feel as though, yeah, we were, we were representing Ireland. That's how it was to us. Would one of the Greens ever play for the Whites? And would any of the no. Whites ever play for the Greens? No, no. We, we, it was never the case. No, uh, it wouldn't. It wouldn't have happened. No. So there was none. You didn't go through this experience about being picked. You know, like who's last? Right? Because it was just no, the no. Irish. We knew our team. English. We knew our team. Yeah. You know, because the UK was a was a an intolerant place. Yeah. At certain stages, both my upbringing. Yeah. And your upbringing. I think certainly th for my mum and dad's generation, when they moved to England, clearly so. through the seventies, it was a, it was a tough time. Certainly for Irish men and women when they when were, they were moving during that period. Yeah, were in their time by their telling of it, were were they prejudiced against? I ask that because by your own telling, there was a, a widespread, firm, flourishing Irish yeah. community where you. Pre grew who's up. meaning prejudice against the English? 
Well, I've, what I would say to you is this, right? And Vice I've said versa. It well, or, or was it simple, you know, you're talking about sporting rivals? I, I think it was very much in, certainly when I was growing up, it was them and us. Mm. Because there was never any other person that set foot in our house, in, in our door, who wasn't Irish. And there, it simply wasn't. There was no English voices that used to come into the house. My mum's best friend, Phyllis Darty, who's a Dublin woman herself, she would be, she, when my mum would go to her house and, and vice versa, she'd come to our house most nights. And... We just didn't have it. We didn't, and you know, you know, you probably look back at it yourself, and it probably was. It was. It was almost as if we've got a we've got to fight our own corner. If you want to, yeah, you, you maybe use the word prejudice. It probably was that we didn't come across too many English uh, men and women when I was growing up, apart from when I maybe went to school, and then obviously local, the local church. Most of the people when we used to go to church on a Sunday, go to mass on a Sunday, would have been would have been Irish from Irish families. That's kind of how it was for us. When that very fertile playtime football bred a very good team. How was it picked? And was it always picked on talent alone? Because the school a teacher team. must have picked yeah. the team. And yeah. Did, we, did we, you we always had, feel it was talent. talent alone? Yeah, but it probably Never was a division that. between, like, was the teacher English or Irish? Yeah, the teacher was English. The teacher was totally English. Big Preston North End fan, actually, on my school teacher. But totally English. It didn't have, no, there was no prejudice like that. Absolutely no prejudice. I think he just recognised the, the talent that we all had and he wanted to try and harness that as much as he could. Very, very proud that four of his boys had mm. again gone should on to. It could have been five, perhaps should have been five. I mentioned Thomas early on, Tommy Taylor. He was he was certainly one that was very much on the periphery. He got released by Sam Allardyce at sixteen, but Thomas was a very, you know, very, very quick footballer, unbelievably quick. He was like you know one of these lads that you see trial, child prodigy score so many goals. But when he he seemed to maybe hit a level at fifteen, sixteen. And Sam Allardyce then released him, so I said he could have been another one. But we did have four Pullman men, and me, Chris Borick would have been another, John Callaghan and myself. We were the four that, that did manage to, to go on and develop, yeah. You, you obviously caught my attention because, you know, nobody's ever actually complained, those who are listeners, but like, I do tend to hammer on about street football mm. and the values and the, the lessons, the type of footballer that's bred from having to play on the street, maybe dodge cars, invent passes off walls or lampposts, yeah. but also just that toughness about like the ball is important because we won't have another one because money's a bit tight. The reason I asked about that was that, you know, that having a grass pitch to play on mm. once or twice a day at school isn't typical of that street football ethos. And yeah. I can understand how, <laughs> you know, if you talk about Seedorf or, or Bergkamp or Van Persie, the Dutch school of street football, Frank Reichard once, you know, told me it was like kill or be killed. Yeah. And what happened at the end of a six v six or seven v seven on the street mm. in Amsterdam was the two best players were then mano a mano. I grew up with street football. That's exactly how it was. Up to the age of eleven, before I went to high school, it was. As I mentioned, my brother earlier on. I'd say probably my brother would have, and you only maybe look back at that and reflect upon that. He was the biggest influence simply because he was two years older than me, a brilliant footballer in his own right, growing up. And we just used to play on the street. We used to play on the, I mentioned St. Gregory's earlier on. St. Gregory's is a concrete playground. So we played football on the concrete in school there and on the street, outside Tennis the ball, house. football, anything, what kind of football? Anything. Anything we had, honestly. And predominantly it would have been a size three or four, for even up to a five football, whatever we could get. But we'd play tennis. Yeah? We'd play tennis ball underneath the school benches. Yeah. Underneath the school benches, put two benches together, two asides, winner stays on. All these sort of things. Would you that, call that cuppies? Cuppies, yeah. Cuppies, yeah. We used to have it all. Well, well the cuppies was actually two, two a side or even one a side, single cuppies or double cuppies. Two v two it. with a keeper. One keeper, yeah. and then you just play off against each other. World yeah. Cup, we called it. Yeah, cuppies. It was brilliant. Yeah, wasn't it? but th that was. It it makes you very competitive. Amazing. Ama amazing. And, you know, you, you could have six doubles or you could have six singles. However, it was. However, you, your games would always judge on the amount of players that you had. If there was 12 players, obviously, then you'd try and have doubles. You score a goal, you through to the next round. And it, they were great. They were, they were just brilliant, brilliant times growing up playing all these individual things like this. That was certainly in the schoolyard at St. Gregory's Cuppies. Yeah. If you had six doubles, you wouldn't necessarily see a lot of the ball, would you? Depends how good you are. No, go on. Eh? <clears throat> well, yeah. Well, you've got to hold on to the ball. You've got to hold on to it. Yeah, that's the way it was. And, you know, but maybe when I, in the later part of my career, I wouldn't have seen it, but predominantly from the age of maybe 14 to 18, 19, 20, 20, whatever it was, I was a dribbler. That's how I was. I was just basic. I was a powerful lad, not necessarily in the dribbling mode of an Iniesta or anything like that, but I was a, a player that could hold on, certainly handle himself physically, but I was a dribbler. I, I, I was, my responsibility on the pitch, or the responsibility I was given, 
by the manager was, you carry the ball for us. You've got to get us up the pitch. You've got to be the player that's getting us. But you're not just talking about distance. You're talking about ability to go past somebody, yes, right? in tight areas, yeah, particularly when you're playing How would the you go past somebody in them days? What uh, were your, you, think about your repertoire. It was always a step over. We tried to, because I love Chris Waddle. I love Waddle. So who, who doesn't? Yeah, who loves Waddle? Yeah, I, I love Waddle. Saying that, you know, saying that, I, some of my heroes would have been the Irish players. Of course, Kevin Sheedy, yes, a left sider. Of course, Paul McGraw would have been a huge hero of mine growing up. But I love Chris Waddle. I used to love Waddle watching him in the late 80s, early 90s, playing for Tottenham, then playing for Marseille. I, me- I remember him playing for Marseille in those famous European Cup games. That dribble against uh, AC Milan when he's tried to beat five players, he goes around the keeper and falls over. I, I remember all these things vividly, watching Waddle, because I used to just love Waddle. So I would tr- always try step-overs. What, what try... did you think? He, so step-overs he did, but were you conscious in watching about where the shoulders were? Because we asked him in this series, and we doubted it for a little while, up in his in his loft with his statuettes of Laurel and Hardy and his CD collection and pictures and shirts from his career. And we thought, well, not everybody that does great things in sport knows how they do yeah, it, he shall did. we ask or not. Yeah. He could describe to a millimetre which foot was where, yeah. where the ball was, how long he waited before the defender would come in, the shoulders, the balance. I know. Did you clock in anything about that when you watched him? Or did you just go out there and try and mimic it? I had a bit of a... A bit of the his running style, anyway. You know, taller. You know, Chris Waddle and I are probably similar sort of height. I've never seen in a million years I was any I was anywhere near the class that he was. But I used to try and mimic him, certainly from the step over over point of view. So certainly when I was younger, anyway. Maybe when I got a little bit older, and you've got to maybe try and. I don't know. Maybe try and maintain place in the side. If things aren't working for you, you've got to try and work harder and. Be more conservative. Yeah, maybe right. Maybe don't do not do something that's going to get you out of the team. Where you, you, I think back and I watch Waddle and I think, how did he do it? How, how on earth he never did he had it? that thought. No, he didn't, exactly. I think that's part of it. Yeah, he didn't. He was total belief in himself and he didn't, he, he didn't seem to, to care what people thought. He had total belief in his ability. And again, I, I've spoken to him. I, I sit down with him sometimes and I see him at games and I just, I'm engrossed listening it's to him joy, for, for 20 it? minutes. He's, he's just an amazing fella to talk to. Mm. We've, had him, we've had him on the show with Off The Ball as well at times. He'd gladly give us 45 minutes of his time. The one thing, again, you said there, he, taught, he, he said something to me. He said, when I was at Marseille, he said, I'd get the ball and I'd start to run with it. And what I used to hear behind me was, and he'd hear this. And we were like, and he'd think, what is that? And he said, he always used to hear it. And it was people standing up seats. because it was a clattering of the yeah. seats. And I couldn't believe he had, he had this thought process as he's actually going to try and beat defenders. It was just amazing to me. But it's an incredible human instinct that if something's entertaining, you stand up. I love that. And, and you're right that he's peripherally aware of it or he asked what it was. But to be able to do that. I know. Whoa. I know. I know. I, I asked you about when, when, when your original, ta- you were tasked by coaches. You said you called it carry the ball. Yeah. But that wasn't what you started off talking about. You started about that you had a dribble. Yeah. Which I love because one of the things that separates the football I watch from afar in England and that I watch locally in La Liga is there are still far more players who can beat a man. Yeah. One way or the other. Yeah. There, there are several in the Premier League, but it's, it's given less um, importance. Mm. So you had that. I did. To Wait, an, how, yeah, how did the step over? You're a lefty. You've been reaching for your. Um... I always step over the left foot, but when I then started to develop and I was working with different people, I was trying to get taught to step over the right foot. So it was almost step to the right. Obviously, take with your left. So you're going onto your stronger foot. Then, when I was growing up, it would have been the left foot because it's probably the natural thing. My stronger leg, mm-hmm. step over the left foot. So maybe a step over the left foot. Maybe go inside players, or maybe just I used to have a decent drag. Maybe the John Robertson drag as well, where you could try Whoa. and drag it across your, your you, body you, a little you bit. You reach for Tuca for Christy yeah. Waddle and John Robertson. <laughs> well, I, I need to again, see footage anyway, of you yeah, playing for uh, Waddle Christie. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily. I wouldn't necessarily again put myself in that sort of category. And when I got to then. A little bit older, say about 14, 15, I, I, I developed physically. I seemed to grow tall and I, I got, could run then. And, you know, again, I was, I was fairly quick in my youth. And it just, it, everything started to develop from there. And, again, luckily enough, I mean, I mentioned Sam before, already, but Sam spotted something in me very early when I was 15. And he then signed me at 16. And then I had, uh, you know, a couple of years, under, two or three years under Sam at, at youth football, which was great from a personal point of view to have such a, a great brain who was trying to help me develop. And I think I developed extremely quickly be, between the ages of 15 and 19. I was, 
I was ready at 18. I was ready, ready to go. And that's when I started to develop and then quickly started to make that name for myself that, during that spell. That readiness comes from a host of different attributes. And, you know, I think there must be probably 100,000 footballers who say it was my brother. But, you know, one of the ones that sticks is that for all his talent, Leo Messi as a kid was kicked to shreds by his two big brothers yeah. and says so. And they taunted me and they made me cry <clears> deliberately. And you look at him now... He never reacts. Yeah. Never reacts. His first, his only red card so far was you know, a travesty of a decision in his first international against Hungary. And he's just trying to pull a player who's pulling him back to get away from... And you just about never see his temperament rise or his, mm. you know, that boiling anger. And you talked about your brother, whose name is Farrell. Farrell, yeah. Yeah. And um, he played a, a similar role to you in that mentoring about what it's like to be treated quite tough. Yeah, he did. Well, again, I mentioned before, Farrell was a brilliant, brilliant child footballer, centre-forward, striker, probably the best in the town, striker-wise. Um, unbelievable goal scorer. Regularly be scoring between 70 and 100 goals a season as a, as a really young boy. So, you know, be coming in from the Sunday League games, he I scored seven today. Things wow. like this. He was, he was. He was excellent. And he was scouted from Watford. He was scouted by a number of clubs, actually. But he ended up going to Cambridge, actually. But it never happened for him. He ended up having a, an excellent semi-pro career, non-league, uh, playing as a centre-half or even a right-back at times. But, again, I was on the street. I was this little kid then playing with Farrell and even lads older than him on the street. In the, in the, we had a little bit of a green outside the house, but predominantly we were, it was just on the roads playing football. Yeah. And, again, you mentioned maybe Messi, where it was, you were getting kicked, you, were getting, you couldn't get the ball. So you were having to scrap, you having to try and get yourself in there with all the lads, trying to take the ball off. And if you had the ball, you went past them, you just get kicked. Mm -hmm. That's how it was. Out so, of the dignity, they're not having the ball taken off them by uh, a little. No, exactly. No chance. No chance. So Farrell and his mates and, and even lads above him, you have a lot to thank those lads for as well that you don't necessarily realise. You, you're getting, you're reaching that level slowly but surely, maybe quicker than you think to, uh, to an extent at times. And quicker than you would have done it without that treatment. Definitely, definitely. And then all of a sudden then I, I, I'm playing under 11 football at seven. I'm play, you know, so you're playing three or four years above your age group. That is what you're constantly hitting all the time. As you're doing that, and it, did people menace you at any stage? Do that again and I'll... No, oh, that's without usually, a doubt. Go on yeah, then. That's Without a doubt. The, the older lads, you know, again, you, maybe you talk about... Fights was commonplace. I grew up in a, I grew up in a relatively rough estate. So it was fights were commonplace. Every, you'd say virtually every, every game of football we would have had, a fight would have broke out. So it stands you in good stead when you go to, when you go to play regular football. And I think, I think in general, I think because of that, I mean, again, I would have had quite a lot of fights, the punches thrown regularly with older lads, younger lads, or whatever it would have been. Did you take one? Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. People definitely. forget, people don't know people who haven't been in a fight know that it, it's not like the TV or the film show you. If you get, if you take one, take one, you get a fat lip, and you get, and you get your teeth. Well, not, I never they're rattled, enough, don't I never they? Had they teeth, teeth knocked out, bloody nose, black eyes. Yeah, that, that's what you. But that, that's what. And you got to learn to either be first or to to bob yeah. and weave one or the other. Yeah, yeah. I think I took a headbutt once as well. I took a headbutt from one of the older lads as well. Yeah. I did. did you move back? I I did move back, but I got it on the chin. Well, so. see, I, I said people didn't know you're quicker than me. When I was butted in the street once, I saw it coming, which I'm still reasonably proud of. But I only moved back in time, in, enough for them to catch my teeth. Yeah. So, and, and it really damaged uh, these two yeah. front Bugs Bunny teeth, where you were further away. Yeah. You had that little... <laughs> I say that because we can talk about fights. And, you know, you, you, you go out and play professional football. We're really feisty people. Mm. And I'm certain that you'll have seen dressing room fights and training room fights. Because... Without being ten a penny every day, they are part and parcel of yeah. that really competitive yeah. element. I think you're right in saying that. Not every day, but certainly you, you would have seen them regularly. It right? happens. Yeah. But, but anybody who lives a normal life and doesn't do this will hear the word fights. And they won't realise that they're, unless you win, they're pretty grubby things to be involved in. Yeah. It kind of, yeah, well, it goes against you because if, if you lose a fight, then you lose face. Yeah, people then tell you. Yeah. Someone then has got the upper hand over you. I didn't lose too many, I have to say that. I wouldn't have lost too many because I had, I don't know, I just maybe had some, I think Farrell and me both had it where uh, my brother's a prison warden now and I think he loves it. He loves it if there's any sort of conflict because he, he's naturally, I think, you know, when you've been brought up in, in the environment we were probably brought up in, it was how it was. It was how it was growing up. That's so what did you have? Are you talking about like, say, a mental thing or c could you have boxed? I think or... people that would know me would probably think, yeah, I'm not really a... An aggressive guy wouldn't necessarily have that in me, but 
growing up, you had to you had to defend yourself at times. We're you not necessarily to... talking about aggressive. I think we're talking about toughness. Toughness, I yeah, that's I'd be right. I think that's I think that's probably fair to say. I think that's right. A toughness that's within you that's come from a lot of knocks along the way that a lot of lads from the council estates would have had. Mm. And that I wouldn't certainly be the only lad. So many of the lads that would have played the game that would have been from a similar sort of background to me, a similar sort of environment growing up to me, would have would have had to hit or be hit, essentially, mm. at times. That's mm. the way that it is. So, therefore, if the guy on the golf course had ever caught you for stealing golf balls, <laughs> you, you could have dealt in one of the... <clears throat> no, I don't know about that. I think he was, he was an older fella. He was about 12 or 13, yeah. Just, or, pay, just paint the picture for me. Preston Golf Course, anyone anyone that's listening that might have played Preston Golf Course, I think, I think <laughs> it was about... You played and still looking for the ball? Yeah, about the fifth, I think, I think it's the fifth hole I played there. I remember, if you if you could drive it far enough, I actually played there recently and I hit a crap drive, it went along the ground and into this dip. So maybe 100, 150, 180 yards ahead of you, there's a dip, so it goes right down, you can't see can't anyone see that's beneath you. And that's when most of the balls went. Most of the people that are amateur golfers would have been hitting it into this dip. Very rarely would the ball fly over the top of it. So we then used to run in out of the woods that were just at the side of the golf course, nick a couple of the golf balls and gone. And then you'd have golfers chasing you. We, we, we'd run down to the woods. We, we had great escape routes, so we knew where to go. <laughs> so no one could catch us. And we were obviously quite quick as well. It's a great description. Then word got round when these lads would finish. Look, there's a lot of hooligans at the fifth or whatever it would be. Can you go and sort it out to the greenkeepers and things like that? So then the greenkeepers would come out, and then we get. But these lads were more serious. They they wouldn't let go. They'd chase us and chase us and chase us. So then that's maybe built up our endurance. That built up our fitness levels <laughs> invariably. Yeah. So then we were, we were ready for all sorts. Then you could turn anything to your advantage yeah. in later life, can't you? Yeah. I remember once when uh, Bobby, one of my mates, when we, we there was a little brook at the bottom when you were trying to get away from the golf course, and we've all jumped jump the brook, all getting away the other side, and we're all away, there's no bother at all. Anyway, he looks down then, halfway up the road, no shoe. The shoe's got stuck in the mud at the other side, oh, no. and, he, and he goes, I'm not going back for it, I'm no not way. going, so that was it, just left it, just left it there, yeah. And like say, uh, listen, you, you're talking to a mischievous person. I would have seen the inside of a <clears throat> cell in a number of different countries, so I'm not, yeah. I'm not throwing mud <clears throat> at you, but like, oh, well, I have, what yeah. did you do with the golf balls? <laughs> Ah, I think we just because I, I think there's a certain fun of just nicking things nicking like them for the for the laugh. Like, well, it was just literally for the laugh. I think yeah. we we would have actually one or two lads would have had a five iron and or a seven iron, and we would have gone on to the local yeah. green and yeah. just hit some balls, things yeah. like that. What, what we'd nicked, it would have been probably you might have got two, and then you might have had a once you've got away the first time. We might have only got four because that, that's when. This fellow we used to call Tractor Joe. I don't know whether his name was Joe, but we used to call him Tractor <laughs> Joe. So we used to come out on this tractor and chase us. It was like coming over the, the hill with a tractor. Yeah, like, run lads, run. Yeah, it was exactly it's like very that. Good. It's very Steve McQueen. Now that, uh, now it that was exactly it. like that, yeah. And um, <laughs> it was again, it was just mischievous kids and things like that. And I mentioned before, I was playing the golf course last year, it was. And all I can think about... <laughs> If these if, if the kids come out and nick me ball, I would just laugh. I would just laugh at them doing it. It just go on your go, go on, fellas. There you go. go on, fellas. But uh, no, it didn't happen, unfortunately. No. Now, you you wouldn't, if you had any sense, give me any responsibility for anything in life. But I do try to learn and listen. One of the things that's really important in life is not to do unto others what's done to you. I mean, that's quite a basic theme yeah. in a good person's life. So let's talk about your sister. Yeah. And I'll give some context here in that recently we were down in uh, Wimbledon uh, with Jamie Murray. Yeah. And he was describing him and Andy as youngsters battering hell out of each other. So they used to have a sort of a sort of mattress down on the floor like the ring, and then one of them would climb up the ladder and jump down <laughs> onto the other. And Judy Murray would come in, lads, lads, what are you doing? He was all over in the middle of a boat or whatever. Now you know, Farrell booted you. Yeah. And Farrell, what did you do to your sister? Well, I'll tell you what, Farrell was a good boy. Farrell was a good lad. He was, in fairness. Gerald and me, we were, we were little urchins. We would fight. We would fight. Um, Geraldine used to be we used to go Irish dancing, so she'd have her, her heavy shoes, her heavy Irish dancing shoes. And the back, if you take a whack with those... Oh, I'd say. And she'd batter me with ease. So she'd give, she'd give as good as she got, Geraldine. She'd, she'd get her Irish dancing shoes. A steel and she toe would, cap, that's yeah, going to break a shin. Yeah, exactly. So you get, you get waxed with those. I don't know, Ger Geraldine and I, we definitely used to have a love-hate relationship when we were growing up because I said before, we used to fight like cats and dogs. It was, it, and it was, again, probably ferocious in the house. How my mum caught with us, I don't know. <laughs> we, were, we were probably a little bit unhinged, I think, at times growing up. 
But yeah, Geraldine, uh, Geraldine give as good as she got. That's what I would but say. But by your own admission, there was a WWF offence. There was some worldwide wrestling. We used to do. Uh, yeah, I mean, I it, it, it was about called. the time when you started to watch wrestling. It's probably more the old school wrestling, Big Daddy and Giant Thank Hairstacks. Thank you. Now, now we're talking lads. some sense. Yeah. So that's your man so, Sinclair yeah. and oh yeah. So it was. McManus. It was all yeah. You would you know if Gerald Geraldine's on the floor, you're dropping the old you know the forearm onto yeah. the elbow. All we we call that smash of, in the, the smash. Yeah, in the tread. <laughs> But there was, yeah, there was, there was, there was everything like that. We had everything like that. Every, you name it. If we watched it on telly, we'd have done it. And that's how it was with us. Yeah, they, they, you think yeah, you, you get you get the memories back from that from Geraldine and myself. And I just I, again, I can't imagine the noise that we would have made within the house as well because it was it was carnage at times. Yeah. I'm also, um, just at the end of this year now, you said it yourself in passing that at times your mum, who is raising you at the stage, all three of you on, on her own. There wouldn't always be enough to to buy food to eat. Yeah, yeah. Now that's a that's a at the time it's all very well looking at you now, you know, growing up a dad to two, mm. successful, you know, a fantastic representation for Preston for your mum, you know, and for your career. I mean that, mm. and that's the reason I asked you to talk today because, mm. you know, you you made a a successful life and you're a guy of of, of dignity and worth. But like to reach a point where we don't have the money for yeah. this or that meal, it's a very tough thing to deal with. Yeah, and uh, it's looking back to say that was the making of mental health. Uh, it, it kind of felt like that at the time. No, um, I remember we'd have the gas meter till the work. It was a pound meter, and we you could stick a knife into the meter so you could actually put your pound in, flick the flick the pound out, and turn it so you get. Because we, we didn't, at, at times on, on weekends, and I remember, I was even talking to Geraldine about it recently, where mm. we'd, we'd have a weekend without electricity in the mm. house. And that was, it was genuine, it was how it was. It went, again, it wasn't every weekend, but it was, it was a regular occurrence in no the house. No TV, no heat. No TV, we had a, we had a, we had a metre TV as well. Mm -hmm. And that was another thing as well, that was a, you put 50p in the back of the telly. So I grew up and understood this, and we, you know, we grew up with paraffin lamps in the house and all this kind of stuff. So all I would say is that for anybody who does not know what you're talking about, you're literally talking about you fed whatever coin it was at the time uh, into the meter. 50, it was fifty p in the in the TV meter and mm. the and the lecky meter. Mm. It was it was pound in the gas meter though. Mm. So it was a pound coin. So it would have been about when the pound coins come in. Probably I would have been about twelve, be late eighty, wouldn't oh, it? I be? know something like gone that. already. Yeah, and I feel like a grander. Yeah, but like it, without these coins. You wouldn't get gas, or you wouldn't get electricity. This was the ultimate pay as you go. Everybody pay gets their go, bills yeah. now, and everybody gets credit now, yeah, and yeah. everybody kind of says, "Oh, well, I won't pay the lucky bill until it goes from a red final demand in a, an orange final demand." Yeah. That, that if you didn't put your money in, you didn't get what you needed. Well, exactly what it was. Again, it wasn't a regular occurrence. We didn't have food on the table, but it, it happened. It happened all too often, I think. Then. For, for probably our liking probably growing up particularly you to get to the end of the month or maybe the end of the week mm. and a Saturday and Sunday mm. and you wouldn't have any food they would, they wouldn't, and that's it's a, it's a genuine fact that's how it was Another um, interview in this series was with Gordon Strachan who I adore and there are widely varying views of him because he can be tart with his phrases and, mm. and impatient too but one of the things he's doing right now is putting a lot of time and effort into a football scheme in Edinburgh whereby they know that, particularly in the holidays, the kids who either have talent or who could be getting into really serious trouble, yeah. if the school isn't on Easter holidays, Christmas holidays, summer holidays, kids don't eat. Yeah. So he's putting a lot of time and effort and money into making sure that they come to train, and if they come to train, whatever their standard is, there'll be sponsors will provide a meal. There'll be yeah. some sort of decent food for them there. It's extraordinary in, um, when I say our country, you're an Irishman, but you're talking about England. Mm. Um, I grew up in the UK. It's extraordinary that well, then, in the 80s? 80s, yeah, it would have been, yeah. For and now, years, essentially, yeah. we're still talking about a country that can't see to it that those who might fall between the cracks of society because of a home where there's one parent or there's not enough work or whatever it is, that people can't eat. Yeah, it come to mind maybe four or five years ago, maybe a bit longer than that, actually. Davy Weir would be a good friend of mine. Great man. And Davy, Davy said to me once when we were, we were chatting about it, he said it's almost something that, yeah, you do take for granted, but he sees it as the one privilege that we've got in, in maybe our life, in our lifestyle now, is to have food in your fridge, regular food on the table, good food on your table, you know, a good diet, good food, because 
the crap that we ate when we were kids. It was mm. any, anything just to get some sort of food into mm. us. Whatever was cheap and available. Anything that's cheap and available, mm. exactly what it was. Mm. So it is a privilege, I think, for, for our generation, the next generation now, where you don't necessarily have these worries. There are, there are people that do have these worries, don't get me wrong, but I think certainly from my point of view now when I look back, and if I've got you know, decent food in the fridge or I can, I can afford to eat decent food, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And, it, I, and again, I don't say that lightly because I know, mm. I know how it's been, I know what it was like. Do you know what it is? I think, and it's something maybe, the, maybe my mantra in life, you get on with it. That's the way mm. it had to be mm. because, I think mean, going back before, you sink or swim. You know, I'm not saying, you know, that there are certain challenges that have come my way throughout my life, but it's sink or swim, you get on with it. You've got to, you've got to get on with it and you've got to look to tomorrow, you've got to look to the day after to see how, how it's going to, uh, to see how, how the next day will be and then you start to develop and you start to get better because of the setbacks that you've had along the way. That's, that's the way that I've always been and that's, I think it has been down to, to my upbringing and how it was and, and the certain hardships that we had at times, but that was how it was. I thoroughly approve, and um, I can't lie, I had, a, I had a slightly different, you know, upbringing and chance in life, but for some reason or other I was gifted with this. So one, get on with it, and, and, and not just tough it out, but find a way to make something out of bad circumstances, and a little bit of resourcefulness, yeah. and a little bit of cheekiness too. Yeah. Um, yeah. We skip, this is like a sort of audio book where you can shuffle. Yeah. Let's shuffle forward to um, being drawn in a World Cup qualification group with Holland. Because, you know, a great deal has been made, understandably, about Saipan and, and what happened there and the effects it did or didn't have on the subsequent World Cup. Yeah. But getting there mm. still fascinates me. And one of the things we hope to do in this podcast is not only to let people hear the real character, or at least something approximating the real character yeah. of the people that they admire, but one of the privileges um, that all of you that we speak to have had excluding the, the glory and the fun and the fulfilment and the wages, is that you've been inside. You've savoured the tension, the realisation of dreams, the, the way different people react to stress. And I want to focus on those two games, almost a year apart. In both of them, you had a pretty firm protagonist role. They must count as two of the more glorious moments in your football life. The Holland games, you mean? There's those two yeah. qualifying games against Louis van Gaal's yeah. Holland game. Yeah. The, the I, first in the group game, away. Yeah. The second one... I think that was my best game for Ireland, I think, away, away in Holland. I do, I think. It it's definitely was my the, the game... I was playing in my most natural position. Come back. Come back yeah. a little bit. And we, we won't do the whole group at all, but you're drawn in a group which is Minos plus Ireland plus Portugal plus Holland. Yeah. And... It's pretty clear that whoever wants to be um, neck and neck with Portugal, who are maybe the dominant side, although you get two 1-1 mm. draws off them, it, it's going to be the winner takes all between Holland and Ireland. It's a Holland side that's jam-packed full of Van Hooydonk, Hasselbank, Kluivert, yeah. Van Nistelrooy, Van der Sar, yeah. De Boer, um, Koku, um, Van Bronckhorst. It's a right flipping yeah. good. Was Van, Van Bommel. Well, yeah. There's talent everywhere and toughness yeah. too. And... I'm not saying they should have won because your, your side's packed, but I want to build up to going to Amsterdam, to try and take me back to anything that, what's Mick McCarthy saying? What's the group yeah. saying? Are you intimidated? Have the Dutch said anything about you in the build-up? What's the expectations here well, at home before you give your best game we, for Ireland? We'd gone away, Euro 2000, we'd gone away to America that summer, and Mick had many, managed to keep a core of the squad together. There was only a, a handful two, three, four players maybe that didn't make that trip. So now Quinn and, St and Stan, Steve Staunton came on it, Alan Kelly, maybe the three experienced players. And then the Robbie Keane, myself, Jason was on the trip, uh, Phil Babb was on the trip, Richard Dunn was just coming into it, he was on the trip as well, Shea was on the trip. We had, we had a good nuke of the squad that was going to take us forward over the next few years. And Mick did, Mick did great in actually getting us all to go on that trip. We played South Africa, Mexico and the US. And Mick gave us a couple of nights out there. We bonded. Yes, we did. We had a great time. We came back from that trip. We'd just missed out. Of course, we'd missed out on the playoff against Turkey. I'd played in both the playoff games against Turkey. Again, I felt that was maybe... The Turkey game was maybe when I fully felt at home in the Island squad. It took, me, it took me a long time. It didn't mm -hmm. take me two years. Nervousness around the squad. Um, that true feeling of, of belonging in the squad. I'd made a few 
a few, I played a few games in competitive games, but I hadn't necessarily nailed down a place in the squad, first of all. To, to your own satisfaction, Yeah, to my own mean, satisfaction. Yeah, that's, yeah, that, that's definitely yeah. fair to say. I played in the, in the two playoff games, and it was just before me moved to Sunderland, and I felt great. Really, at the top of my game, felt brilliant. And then off the back of those games against Turkey, actually, Jared Hooley had, and had spoken to Steve Stones, and Steve Stoughton co- contacted me at Liverpool. They, they, were, they wanted to take me to Liverpool. But anyway, I went to Sunderland, and, I, and after that, I wasn't playing particularly well for a time. So when we went away in that summer, just had a really poor first year, 18 months in particular at Sunderland. And so we went away that following summer anyway. And I think my whole career, and it was something that Packy Bonner had said to me, try and peak for the international games. So it was always something that was in my head. Growing up, that's all I wanted to do. I mean, I yeah, I mentioned, yeah, I'm from Preston, but I was a Celtic fan growing up. And all I wanted to do, if, if you could have given me one team, it would have been a club team, it would have been Celtic. But if you could give me one team to play for, it would have been Ireland. Mm-hmm. That's all I wanted to do to play for Ireland. And I think when I got in, I was overawed with everything. So it, it did take me time to adjust. But going back to the Sunderland thing, I didn't, when I stepped up to Premier League level, I don't think I did myself justice in the first, first few months. Then Mick took us away, and then I felt as though I was part of the squad after that, after the playoff games. We had a few friendlies, and after that, we went away in the summer, played a few games out there in, in the US. You win your Spurs if you can handle stuff on a night out as well. Yeah, with, yeah. With, with, you know, you, you yeah. smile and you laugh. With Big Nile. I'm not, <laughs> well, yeah. it's just a truth of football. Yeah. If you can handle a night out, if you can hold your drink, if you can be funny. <clears throat> yeah, um, probably, yeah, it's probably true. All of those things really mould yeah. a group. Yeah, I think Particularly was, on another continent in the summer. Yeah. And, no. pati- and particularly with it, we'd gone away from the times in the Big Jack where literally the lads seemed to be out every night. Mick, Mick had got the reins on us to an extent. Mick was starting to discipline us more so we might have got a night out after a game. We, we mm. did it at the right times essentially. Mm-hmm. But the trip to America just, it brought everyone together. It did. You know, I've become good friends with Shea, Gary Breen, Kenny Cunningham, Steve Stoughton, Niall, room with Niall, start to room with Niall then regularly, become good friends. And I think it, it really brought us together. So we were on the upward curve hitting the first game against, against Holland in Amsterdam. And in the lead up to that game, I mean, we were working on team shape through the week and I probably wouldn't have been starting the game. But anyone who probably listened to it would remember it. We had the famous Starsky and Hutch incident, which was Phil Babb and Mark Kennedy after, after a night out. We'd met up early on in the week so the game was on the Saturday and we were we, Mick gave us a night out on a Sunday mm-hmm. so we went out for a few drinks I think we ended up in town and I spoke to Mark about it subsequently with Mark Kennedy and he said to us yeah he goes I'd spoke to Babsy and I said look let's just get home let's, let's go on we'll do it right for tomorrow we'll have a few beers and go so they've left most of the squad there they end up walking I think they're off the, off the back of Hardcourt Street they see Babsy had this trick where he could roll across the bonnet of a car <laughs> It's a handy trick. Starsky and Hutch mode. So he said, look, this Starsky and Hutch. So he rolled across the bonnet of the car. Unbeknown to him, the car belonged to a a police officer. (laughs) (laughs) So it was parked near enough to the police station. It was, it was, uh, it wasn't, obviously it wasn't the police car, but it was her own personal car. I know. Babsy's done this dive across the car. She sees it. Police are called. The two are arrested. No way. Yeah, the two are arrested in the lead up to that Holland game. So we had turmoil. Typical, we had so much turmoil around our squad regularly stories would get out and something just got out of hand and it would be carnage. So Mick McCarthy and Mick Byrne, who would have been the physio at the time, they would have had to go down and get the two lads out of the cells. They were in the cells overnight. They had to go to court and Sparky tell, tells a great story around it, how he was, you know, the, all the lads in the cells were giving him loads. Of, you, you, you're bleeding shite anyway, giving all the lads and all this sort of <laughs> It won't matter if they no get you out of here. Yeah. So <laughs> the, two, the two lads then had to leave the squad. Mick dropped them from the squad for that no. game. So me and Mark Kennedy were the two. Mark Kennedy was probably just ahead of me at that time in the in the. Mark had played at Liverpool, if I'm not. Yeah, yeah, it was at Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it was. I think he was back at Wimbledon at the time. Okay, yeah. Wimbledon, of course, were a Premier League club at that at that time. Mm. And so basically, the role was mine. I got mm. I got the I got the starting position, and uh, I started against Holland, and it was almost yeah. I'm just taking it on from the last qualifying games, those two playoff games against Turkey, which we, which of course we didn't lose of the two games, but we, we went out on away goals. Yeah, and that was it. And I just felt as though that was the making of me. So again, I started every, played every single game in that in that qualification campaign, and I just felt great. I did felt really good over there in Amsterdam, and we should have won the game. Yes, it was a disappointing result when we, we allowed them to get back into it what, because we dominated them. What's your game. mentality going into it? Because you clearly at the time couldn't say, oh, look at this squad, but. As good as your group was, 
you know, Holland looked yeah. pretty nippy. Well, Robbie, Robbie Keane was a little bit of the unknown even then. He wasn't necessarily, you know, he'd had, he'd had some good moves, but he was still relatively young and he hadn't started to fulfil the potential that we, know, we knew he was going to reach from seeing him, first of all, in training. Damien Duff. So we had Damien and Robbie. We had Roy in midfield. We had, we had Shea given in goal. Mm-hmm. So we had four players that conceivably could get into most sides around Europe. Carr would have been a Premier League player, wouldn't he? Stephen Carr, yep. Yeah. Stephen Carr was on yeah. the side at that time. Stephen Carr, he was at Tottenham, I think, then. Tottenham, was, I mean, it was before he'd done his knee, Stephen was linked with the Man United. So he, he, had, was made, he was made an offer by Man United. Yeah, that's it. So you had... Hart was... Would, would Ian Hart. Put, me, and Hart me and Hart, he started every game. We had a great combination yeah. down the left. We, we, it just seemed to work the way that we used he to play together. He did a lot of European experience yeah. with Leeds. Yeah. So the way you talk about Robbie there, you know, I judge that you're not still pissed off at him. For... Well, if I remember correctly, that cross from the right for the first goal, he actually takes yeah. it off your forehead. <laughs> yeah, it does, yeah. It does, yeah. When you think about it, yeah, it does. I think it was it was Stephen Carr that set it up, wasn't it? No, Jason, actually. It's a great little play between Jason and Stephen down the right-hand side. And then Jason hung a ball, great ball up to the far post. And Robbie... You, you Rob- must have been... <laughs> you yeah. yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. My, you're my, right there. And he just appears like a, a green does. flash. Yeah, that was Robbie. Robbie was so sharp. He, the, the, the brain on him, you know, the first five yards, his movement was, was so good. He'd get away from defenders. And then... That that was the making of him in many respects, you know, that he got our campaign up and running. I missed a sitter in the game as well myself, actually. But anyway, well, this is, this is you've yeah. gone 2-0 up yeah. before. The, I mean, a yeah. sitter, that's a harsh phrase. <laughs> I, I, you know, but if you'd run, if you just behaved like that, Tractor Joe would have, would yeah. have caught you with that in Preston Links. <laughs> um, 2-0 is, 2-0 comes at a stage where actually Ireland look as if you're dominating the game. Yeah, we were. And they're yeah. ring rusty. They, they don't look right. Yeah. I think we got them at the right time as well. In many respects, they were off the back of the Euros. So, yeah, we'd gone away in a less intense environment. So we had to, had the chance to go and work on things away in America. That was a thing that Mick did. Was there a little bit of structural? Oh, yeah. Than just do, playing the friendly. Yeah, there was a lot. I think Mick recognised he, he had us then for, what would have been about two weeks, I think we went out there. We had a two-week block of training. Wow. We, and Mick got working on the organisation. What was he trying side. to impose? Uh, I think he impressed upon us that... We were certainly then, I think there's a lot of players that were still there from around about the Jack Charlton era, mm-hmm. but I mentioned some of the names there before, Robbie, Ian Hart, you say, Stephen Carr, myself. We weren't all part of Jack Charlton's era, so Jack Charlton synonymous with long ball, direct football. Mick was trying to get us playing in a brand of football. We had, again, if you've got the likes of Stephen Carr and Ian Hart in your team, they were quality footballers. And, of course, Roy Keane in your side as well, Robbie Keane. We couldn't beat lumping it up to, I mean, Niall had a great understanding with Robbie. Robbie used to love playing with Niall, mm. but... Even though Niall had that, you know, physical presence, and he early he was as good as any anyone you'd likely to see. Niall's biggest strength was his was his, his touch. He, he was and, a footballer. And his ability on the ground. I, I would compare him to Crouchy because people just absolutely misjudge Crouchy, who I yeah. turn the TV on to watch every single yeah. game he plays in because I think he's fabulously intelligent and skilled. Totally. And Niall also was irrespective yeah. of aerial ability or height was a footballer. Definitely and. Mick then had recognised that we've got footballers. We had Mark Kinsley, we had Matty Hall in the midfield as well, lads who could play. And again, I think when you're playing alongside Roy, I think he certainly raised levels within the squad as well. I think he brought a little bit of belief to everybody, I think, or nobody, instilled belief in, in everybody. Nobody wanted to take a bad performance in yeah. Roy, never mind the manager. Yeah, yeah, it's fair to say, yeah, that would be true. That'd be very true. And you know that Roy would be on your case if you had a bad touch or made a bad pass or whatever it would be. So, yeah, there was, a, there was certainly an element of that as well. But... Roy used to speed up and slow down the game. He had a great way of knowing how to do that, how to influence games that I'd never played with a midfielder like that before. Um, that's why I'd still put him above all the, the, the Premier League, the, the so-called greats. I'd still put him above them all, even playing against him and playing with him for how, how he could dictate games. His ability probably goes unnoticed at times as well. But So you grow aware of this stop, stop, go thing that he can do in a yeah. game as you're playing with him. You haven't experienced that before and you didn't know it I infer from what you've been saying yeah do you immediately understand why he's regulating the tempo of a match or how he's doing it uh, yeah you, you totally understand why he's doing it yes you, you totally do he's he's influencing a game that you know that certainly that's got that's got him trophies there at Man United that he's played with some great players and these this is what the great players do but with, that's not the detail of why you do it when you regulate the tempo of a game in his instance, with you playing, is it to give the lads a breather? Is it because you can see the other side are on the rise? 
is it to lull them into a certain position in the pitch because if it goes slow and it's knocked about, you might draw them into an area. I, I want to know, because mm. you you said that you were appreciating yeah. seeing him doing stop, go, stop, I go, think, go, go. Yeah, if I'm saying early on in games, he had a he had a great way, Roy, of always passing forward. That was the first thing he always said. And, and I, I've been coached by Steve Bruce. He had it at Man United, pass forward. He used to say to everyone, pass forward. It was never... It was never a backwards or a sideways path through Royce. First touch was pass it, get it out of your feet and pass it forward. So he'd always try and get strikers into the game, always try and get them into the game quickly. So in the early stages of the game, the first 20, 25 minutes of the game, Royce, it was always first touch pass forward with real pace and real intensity. So he'd quicken the game up so much that it was bypassing midfielders. So you mentioned the players like Van Bommels, the Seedorfs, the whoever it would be. Koku. They'd stand off him. They recognise his ability, right. maybe half frightened of him as well, okay. yeah. but also mm-hmm. he'd bypass him with his passing ability. And that, in turn, then would get us on the front foot. Maybe myself could get into the game, Jason, whoever it would be, Robbie, as I said before, were in the game early on in the game. He, he'd get you into Not matches. just that the ball comes to your feet, but you know that if, if, if he's going to do that quick passing through a midfield opposition midfield, the Ducks that day, you've got to be alert. Yeah. You've got to be on your game. Definitely, yeah. So and you've I said got before, a different mindset. I think he, re- I think he recognised people's strength on the pitch and got, as I said before, he got them into the game. He, he By moving the ball quickly, I can imagine him playing with someone like, you know, the, the Giggses or the, the, the Sharps before him, the Kinchelskis, these lads that would have been brilliant wingers in their own right, but he would have got them into the game. He would have recognised, look, these lads can't be stuck out wide. These lads can't be passengers in game. I've got to do my bit to get these lads into matches. And that's what he did. That's what he did. It's certainly in the early stages of the game. So whether you were playing Holland or whether we were playing Andorra or Estonia in that group, it wouldn't have mattered. He would have influenced games very quickly, and that was why I think he had a big, inf- he had a huge influence over those games against uh, Holland home and away and Portugal home and away. Yeah, because the creative players, for however good they look when they're doing things right, you would have a foot in both camps. Athlete uh, work are solid, clever, but also creative dribble, step over. The creative player needs to feel that they're that they're worthwhile, that they're on the ball. Yeah. The more they're starved, some of them will, if not shrivel a little bit, you're likely to get less of a return. Yeah, I agree with that. I think you want to be in the game and you don't want to be having a touch every 10 or 15 minutes. At times, some of the games that we would have been coming up against, we would have been having to defend. You kind of come in and play solidly and do a job for the team. But you want to be expressing yourself. That's how I was brought up. That was, maybe was, was the strength in my game. And that's what, he used to enhance. He used to enhance everyone within a team just by getting them into the game early. So after his namesake robs your goal, Jason scores one of the goals of his life yeah. against Van der Sar, who seems to be able to lie at one post and touch the other post, yet Jason curves it round him. Yeah. Can you remember the feeling? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do. I remember, I remember the goal really well. And it's part, part, partly because you see it back as well, but it was the play up before it there was a lovely little one-twos. I think it was Niall and Robbie that were all involved in it. Little one-touch, Jason playing around the corner, go, give and go, getting it back. Then he's on his weaker left foot. He's mm-hmm. 25 yards out. And as you say, he's got to hit it with enough pace to get it beyond him. But he's also got to try and guide it in there because he's on his weaker foot. It could go anywhere, essentially. But it's perfect. It's, it's a brilliant goal from a wide man's perspective. They're the sort of goals you know I would maybe you know hold up as the great goals from a wide man given goals around the corner, outside of my left foot, play it into a striker, check to go on the outside, come back on the inside, receive the pass and try and get your strike away. And Jason did it perfectly. And then we said we got 2-0 up in that game and totally, totally in command of the match. Can you sum up the mentality? Can you remember anything of what's been drilled into you or what you're thinking? Or do you? does anybody, you included, allow themselves to look around and go, look what we're doing, can you hear the fans? Or did they come back and down? It was pissing with rain that night, absolutely pissing down with rain. And the Amsterdam Arena had the roof. It was one of the first ones, I think, around that would have had the roof, but they didn't close it, kept it open. So the pitch wasn't in great nick anyway that night as well. But I just I remember it was, it was, we didn't take our foot off the pedal for that first 45 minutes. We kept on going for them. We wanted to get more goals. We should have scored before we even got the first goal. You put a couple on the nail. He said, of course, we won. Yeah. You, you've, you've put. A yeah. couple there for Quinny. We did. We, we we created we created quite a few chances. We created quite a few in across the course of the game. They just weren't in the match. They weren't in the match before the first goal. They get themselves back in the game, and then we take the kick off. Roy gives me the ball, and then I have a bit of a maze. I end up knocking it. The old Stanley Matthews one. Knock it one way, run round the other, get away, and I'm one on one with Van der Sar, literally 
10 seconds after they after get the, the goal back one, into yeah, it, after 2-1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I and put it's on your <clears throat> strong foot, mm. total confidence that you were going to you were going to score, and I put it wide. And that was, you know, again, it's football, isn't pitch. it? Pitch. <laughs> yeah, I blend the pitch. It's bobbled, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You set up. that up really yeah. well yeah. about yeah. four or five minutes ago. Yeah. Yeah. Hats off to you, Mr. Bond. Exactly Bond's. what it was. Exactly Fantastic. what it was. The pitch. And, um, I, and I walked right into that as well. <laughs> But yeah, that's the thing. You look back and you you look back in your career. You could have had big moments like that. I should have scored. I definitely should have scored. And and then that allowed them to gain a bit of momentum off the back of that. And Van Bronco scored a goal. A bit of a deflection, actually. Big deflection, uh, but yeah. from range, she has got no chance. The crowd have no, gone mad. No, it was actually Alan Kelly was in that night. Alan, 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 Alan Kelly was in goal that night. Yeah. She tells a great story about how he was dropped before that game. He thought he'd have been starting, and he was. I don't think he was even on the bench that night. Shea. Well, Alan was a great goalkeeper and he's all right. Yeah, yeah, but are we and, talking another Starsky and Hutch? Uh, no, no. I think he hadn't been playing. He had a few injuries. He'd had a few injuries at the start of the season, I think it was, or through the pre-season. So because that game was at September, I don't know if he played. Shea said he was raging. Shea was, the, Shea was the angriest man when he didn't play or when he didn't get things his own way. Shea was the sort of lad at a club, if he, if he gets dropped for one week, I think he says it himself. I remember he t- I've read it in his book. Bobby Robson drops him for a, for a big game. His transfer request straight in. Like he was that sort of lad. He had to play. He had to play games. And uh, but, but that if you're a competitor and if you consistently produce, that's only yeah. a demonstration of how. Yeah. I think that's the, the misconception for a lot of people. It's like um, you know when someone like say Shea put a transfer request. Imagine the Geordies. They'd have been slaughtering, wouldn't they? Of course. And it's like, oh, how can you want to walk away from this club and everything? But it's not that. It's not that. It's nothing no. to do with nothing to do with money or anything like that. He wanted to play games. Mm. He's thinking, they're snubbing me here. This is a total rejection. I want to play games. Puts a transfer request in. And uh, that was the... I remember it around that time. But anyway, Shea... Sorry, just to, I'm going off on a bit of a tangent there. But yeah, he did... Um, he, did he was dropped for that game. And Shea then was in and out, maybe through that group. And then finally then, you know, certainly in the in latter stages of that qualification campaign, he got himself in. And, and then he was a regular then for a long time. So given that this is our sort of bookends that I want to do, you, you, you go through the rest of the group, as I say, too really big um, mm. performances against Portugal. Yeah, we got, uh, got those back-to-back. We didn't lose a, away in Amsterdam or in Lisbon. We, so we, we get two massive results to start with. We played really well over there in Portugal as well against that game. And I say it before, I think the, one of the best individual performances I've ever seen was Rui Costa. Rui Costa mm. in Dublin was just sensational. He was Describe sensational. Describe him for those who, who aren't old enough to have seen him play. Describe that elegant Portuguese midfielder. Oh, he was just... I, mean, I was directly up against Figo that day. So I'm, I'm going to, Again, I'm going a bit further ahead of, of, of myself here. But the game in Dublin, they battered us. Portugal were brilliant. Figo was, was very good. I, you know, Ian Hart would have been marking him. He'd have been a right winger. But he would have been reliant upon me to get back and help out as much as I can. So invariably, I'd have spent 80 minutes of that game trying to get back helping Harty out because he didn't want to get... What was your get... role in a situation like that against Figo? Is it closing up inside so that he can't... Come in or party or I'm trying to come wrong side essentially yeah so I think I would have always been a very good communicator on the pitch and how I would have got whether I was I was playing at fullback or whether I was playing in front of me so you try and give Harty a little bit of guidance show him into me I'm you know I'm coming on your right I'm I'm coming from whatever it would be if I'm in front of Harty obviously he can see the, the angle that I'm trying to come yeah, yeah. at but if he can't see me and I'm maybe coming from his inside just to try to give him that communication of to look I've got your back. Show him, show him into me. I'm inside you here now. Show him into me. And so hard to them, which obviously angle of approach, get his body around it. Show him into me. And we, we, we had a good understanding like that, uh, Harty and me. We did. Um, I used to love playing with him because simply because of his quality. He had the best quality that I'd ever seen in a fullback. Every ball he'd give you was perfect. You're he, talking about his quality with the ball. Yeah. Which not every fullback is asked yeah. to do. He was a very, very. He could have easily played. Old inside left. I think or if he was quicker in, in yeah. midfield. If, if Harty was quicker, if he had a little bit more pace, Chavi. Yeah, Chavi was never quick. Busquets isn't quick. Yeah, but as a fullback though, I don't, I'm, the, I'm talking about he could have played midfield. Yeah, he probably could have done. He probably could have done. Uh, well, at yeah. least I'm, unless my argument because I th- technically I thought he was a fabulous. Yeah. Could argue he's technically our best player. I would think, yeah. You probably argue him and him and Roy certainly would have been the two. That's great praise. because left foot was sensational, sensational. But his right foot was also brilliant as well. So he had two good feet. He was good in the air. He should get the odd, you know, the odd goal as well. Certainly when he was attacking corners and things like that. Well, so that's if he wasn't actually taking them. But also, I just mentioned for if say if he, if he had his pace of his uncle, say if he had the pace of Gary. I think he had the one of the best around. He, I, I think he would he would have gone on and played. He could have played for Real Madrid. He could have played for Barcelona. He was that good. He was just a, a, a brilliant, brilliant footballer. Technically, as good as you would like, as you like. To as say. it but, was, he played at least a 
Champions League quarter. I think it's semi, Champions I think League semi. semi. I think you're right, that Valencia yeah. game. I Valencia, right. yeah. Mm. Okay, so, so the Figo that you encounter, um, who's going to be golden ball, who's going to be a Champions League winner at Real Madrid, mm. when I picture him, and you try to describe what he had to people, and, and Ferguson always said that if he was to sell Beckham, Figo's the only person that he could have yeah. imagined taking that right wing beat. His distribution was very good, and he scored. He struck the ball very cleanly, scored lots of goals, his crossing was brilliant. But you, you talked about you and Chris Waddle, and if I picture Figo now, there was a slight lean forward and hunch to his shoulders. Yeah. Was, there, was there things in his game you recognised from your game as a kid? Uh, yeah, a little bit of that. I think the one thing that maybe stood out, if you're, you're asking me little things about his game, he had a John Robertson drag. That's exactly what Figo had. He used to take it from his, le- his right to his left, so he'd be, he'd be thinking he'd be going on the outside, and he had an almighty drag where he'd drag it right across it, and he could do it on the, off his left and off his right foot. Excellent at both ways. You can see. You can imagine when he's one on one in in a wide area, he didn't know how which crop foot he was going to cross with because he he was so agile, great movement, so graceful with his movement. He could drag it onto either foot, but he didn't have pace. He wasn't a pacey player that's going to run away from you. That's maybe you look at someone like Beckham where you think, yeah, you could maybe draw those sort of comparisons. He wasn't a player that was going to run away from you. So, but he didn't need a lot of space. Yes, to whip. Yes, he had the ability to just open his feet out ever so slightly, and he, but he'd cross it instantly, like a Beckham, where you think, how, how, how has he got that past me? That's what, that's what he had. Yeah, yeah. We, we were on Rui Costa, though. That's a beautiful Figo description. But no, it, it, well, it, it the is. The Rolls Royce of midfield. But you start to see him as well. Again, he, I, I, I certainly don't think he, he, had a, he didn't have as, nowhere near as, uh, as big an influence as, as Rui Costa did that day. But you know when you watch someone and you see them, you're up against them, and you're coming off, it's class, mm. class. That's what that's your, your thing, you know. You shake his hand after the game, and you're like, yeah, he's, he's, he's total class. But Rui Costa was just—he was the most elegant footballer I've ever seen. I've ever seen on the pitch. He, he used to glide past players. He could go off either foot. He could shoot. He could head. Brave. He could take a tackle. And I saw him showing because you know, obviously he's coming to Dublin. He's coming into our backyard, and we've got probably would have been Breeny, probably would have been perhaps would be Kenny Cunningham, Steve Staunton, maybe, and they're going to rough him up. Rui Costa's playing as a number 10, but he's going to also be coming up against, he's going to be pushing on to try to get up against the two centre-halves as well, and he can take it. And yet he's still got the ability as well to, to get himself half a yard, to pick passes out, opening his shoulder at in ways where he knows there's a, if it's a Figo that's on his, on his right-hand side or whoever coming up on the left-hand side, he knows where they are before that ball's even coming to him. And you've seen that. You've, seen, you've watched enough of that type of play with the, the calibre of plays that you've seen over the years where... It just happens like that. It's, it's a split second, and, it, and sometimes they don't even need to take the touch. The pass is away, and then he's away in, in space. You're obviously you're following the ball, and then all of a sudden he's off your shoulder. He what had, just he, happened? He, he, he just had ways. And I just remember that day in Dublin. It was a lovely day, and we, we were poor, actually. We didn't, we didn't get to the level that we got through the group. Roy got us a draw. Roy, Roy was immense that day. Roy, probably maybe Roy's best game, I would maybe, Gosh. I'd maybe argue, that day. Because it was almost as if he's a one-man team for us that day. He got us a point, and it was a huge point for us in the end, actually. But uh, Rui Costa stood out. Him. I just, I just, just watching him and just being in awe. And again, he wasn't necessarily in my in my vicinity. He wasn't anywhere near me, really. But he was, he was the topic of conversation within our dressing room after the game. Wow, what a player he is! And uh, as I said, like they, they ended up top in the group then, um, Portugal before us. Yeah. But the reason you go through, given that they top, although they top by goals, yeah, because you tied on twenty-four points. Is is this um, this nuts game? I mean, crazy game. I don't know what you you feel about it in retrospect, but I mean, if if I can, as a Scot, we're very used to sort of um, brave failure. We're very used to um, producing performances that shouldn't happen against big teams, and then not having the savvy at Hampden Park yeah. to handle a situation. And there are moments in Dublin that look a little bit like that because Holland have their tails up. Yeah. They don't play anything like Amsterdam. They're much more yeah. aggressive and confident. And as a group, and, and you'll tell us about going down to 10, you, you don't look as assured. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So set the say. scene and, and were there nerves coming into it? What were, the, what were the attitudes? What was the manager saying? What was the group's form coming into that? It was a beautiful day. Sun, sun was shining. You can paint the picture on that sort of side of it. So it was a, you know, you don't get many days like that in Dublin, but it was, it was a beautiful day. Packed Lansdowne Road. As good as atmosphere as, as you're going to witness before a game. Crowd in full voice. And there, there was a real change, I think, I, I think around that time as well, saying how the games were being reported. Because 
we, we were starting to see a, a much bigger build up to the matches. You know, we're, we're something say living here now, you start to get a bit of a, a feeling for it now and how the games are built up from a month out or, or three, four weeks out, whatever it will be. We arrive in Dublin and we're front page. You know, next game we've got we've next got Holland, and you've seen all the, the the you know win tickets to the to the big showdown, radios on, TVs on, whatever it is. The only topic is that game against uh, against the the Dutch in Dublin. So you're starting then. You're in, you're you're immersed in it. Then you're around the hotel. You're getting the paper in the morning and you're reading about. You're re- reading what's being said. What's what's the team going to be? Some journals picking. Uh, whoever you know, you know, you can imagine the one to eleven, the, 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 whoever it would. Some of the journals favour one, some of them favour another. They whoever do it would be. Look at that, don't they? Yeah, definitely, definitely. That's the one thing that when Brian Kerr became manager, he ended up taking a lot of the newspapers out and just maybe leave one or two in there, whatever it would be. You can't. You, it's the way it is, isn't it? I think it's the way it is. I think psychologically, I think Brian maybe saw something that would be, would be affecting us. But I think in general, yeah, I think then you start to realise how big these games are, and we analyse the game constantly around the Irish team and things like that and yes we probably don't have the players to an extent now don't, and we're probably we yeah we're probably are harsh harsh on our, on our players at times as well but when we when we're playing for our club we're nobodies when we're playing for our country here we're everything to everybody so that that real intensity around the squad that real that feeling of this game is everything mm-hmm. so it's only going to lead to nerves you, no matter how, you, you're not going to be human if you don't have these sort of nerves around these sort of big games. Good nerves, real bit of you know, bit of I don't know that little knot in your in your tummy around these games. But you, aren't you feeling that from Monday? It's not Saturday you're feeling this. You're feeling that from Monday, Tuesday. Every training session, every every team meeting that you've got, every you know the bits of video analysis that, that we could have done in those days, we wouldn't have done much because we wouldn't have had the technology there. You're, you're immersed in this in this little bubble, yeah, but you're starting to realise that this is it. This is make or break now this weekend. And uh, I would say, yeah, I, I, I think some of those bigger games, you, I, I don't think that's really spoken about at times and how nervous or how how much the players can be affected by these bigger games because there was there was so much riding on it and we were on the verge of something very special but we had this great team this brilliant team in 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 Holland coming to coming to Dublin who of course they were wounded from the result that we got over there in Amsterdam anyway so there's negative tension that some people burn energy during yeah. the week without noticing it Definitely. that they should be using you know in those first 20 minutes or yeah. in the last 10 um, there's nerves that sort of grow during the week and and really only start to hit you on Friday night but also there yeah. are some, and I don't know where you rank and, and how your teammates are, there's some who are just like, yeah, yeah, this is what it's all about. Give me more of this. Yeah. Give me less of I'm doing nobody at the club. Give me exactly yeah. this. Put Ireland's responsibility on my shoulders. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Give me more of that. Yeah, Robbie, yeah, yeah. Robbie would be one of those. Definitely, definitely. I've, I've, He'd I, feed off it. Yeah, I'd never seen a player like him come in at 17. No nerves whatsoever. This is where I belong. I belong here with Robbie when he first came in. Still, probably the best I've ever seen at seventeen. And again, I played with Wayne at seventeen. But Robbie was just a, a, a different breed. Just a, a, an amazing talent, but also mentally so strong. Like nothing would phase him. Absolutely nothing would phase him. And he, he was just this is me. Give, as you say there, maybe give me this. This is what I want. This is me. And maybe probably Roy had that maybe mentality as well to an extent. But what I would say, and what I would argue as well, is that playing for Ireland was my Champions League. Playing for Ireland was everything. I, I, I didn't get the opportunity to play Champions League football, the, the very best, the pinnacle of, of club football. So I wasn't around these big games. I never played a, 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 for playing for Man United or Liverpool or whoever it would be, playing in these big Champions League nights. So this was everything. This was almost like this is what your whole career has been set up for, that you're on the verge of qualifying for a World Cup if you beat this great team here in Dublin. And as you said before, we've had so many, over the years, we've had so many near misses. Ah, what an effort. Great effort, lads. Well done. But you've not been able to get over that final hurdle and go on and do it. And uh, that was certainly in my mind, I felt, because, because we were on the verge of something special, yeah. So looking back to that Thursday, Friday, Saturday morning, Nerves if you can look that... Yeah. How did you react? I would always try to try and you know try and get some sort of consistency in the build up to every game, whether that would be food wise, you know, all all the little things that you've got to do to fit in to, to fit around the game, should I say, to, to you know to get yourself prepared for it. But these sort of games are different. These games are, are, are immeasurably different because you you go for a walk out for a coffee, you're around the hotel, and the 
the level of appreciation for the team from our supporters is just, it has always been brilliant. It's, it's been incredible, the level of appreciation that we've got. And the only thing that they want to talk about is this game. And it's understandable, yeah, you know full well because you've been reading about it all week. But it's it comes down to this to this one big day at Lansdowne on the Saturday. You handled it, can you remember? Yeah, I think I did. I don't think I certainly didn't play my best game for Ireland. It's gone for that memory, that tension is gone from you now. Think, You're one, reaching for a one, memory. Once it, yeah, it probably has. I, 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 I do remember that the tension was there all week. That's one thing I do. But I probably remember more in the build-up than I actually do around the game because once the game then does go... It's kind of you just you're just fully focused on the game. You're focused on what's happening around you. So I think that tension does leave you. I think it does, and that always did. That always did leave me when when the game did actually start. Yeah. Did you feel you were being battered on the day? Yes, I did. I felt as though that we were certainly getting overran. We certainly we were or we were nowhere near of the level from the game in Amsterdam. Nowhere near that. Absolutely nowhere near that. So that was the thing that we were up against it. Overmars was playing brilliantly on the, on the left-hand side for them. And, you know, famously, Gary Kelly got the two yellows and got, got sent off uh, just after half-time. That's the thing that was happening throughout. We were getting overran. We were not necessarily giving loads of chances away, but we were giving a couple of good, really good chances away throughout the game. They were creating things. Clive up by Nesteroy. Yeah. Clive up particularly. Yeah. It was sharp that day. Yes, Had this was. collision with, I think this time, not Alan, but Shea. Yeah, Shea was, the, yeah, Shea was playing, yeah. The where there were a lot of mistakes yeah. from your team. Yeah, Richard Dunn was brilliant that day. That was almost the beginning of him as well. Richard Dunn was so good. I think Richard was only 19 at the time, 19 or 20. He was certainly under 21s. And he came in, um, that would have been probably the biggest game that he would have played in. And he almost single-handedly marshaled the defence that day because he would have, as you said, if, that day with Van Nistelrooy, yes, there was Cliver, yes. There was uh, Pierre van Hooydonk and Jimmy Floyd. Mm. All four, I think all four were on the pitch at one stage as well. And Richard Dunn was having to try to keep all four of them at bay at times. At so, one stage with ten men in green because yeah. Gary had been sent off. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Should, should that goal have come though? I mean, can I remember the I think I, I, I tell you what I do. I do the thing you remember, you're going through that game, you're down to ten men, you're thinking, right, we'll take a draw now. We, we would take a draw. Take a nil-nil or whatever it would be because it, it still would have been a decent result don't for us get going beat. forward. Yeah, exactly. Don't get beat. That, that was probably the mentality. And then you have the chance to get forward and Stevie Finnan got himself in a great position. Another one another one that we had was underrated. Another player, you may be saying you can reel off all these names to you, but a very a, a brilliant player, Stevie Finnan. Brilliant defender. And he created you know that moment for Jason. Jason's Jason's life's built around that goal now. He yeah he 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 loved to yeah, remind you that as well. <laughs> <laughs> he handles he handles so yeah. brilliantly, and he's he's he, listen Jason. But it was also. a great finish. If you look at the technique on the goal yeah. as well, it was it was taken like a he, he struck it like a free kick. Yeah. He gets the ball up and down. You know that again with the technique of that one. If you get it wrong, you just sky it. But if anyone sees it, he's he's wrapped his foot over the ball, so he's hit it as like a free kick, like a like you're trying to get it up and down over a wall. He hit it brilliantly. So there's a parabola to it. Exactly. And again, he's beat Van Bissar again for the, for the second time in the group. And it was a brilliant finish, yeah. Great, great goal. And uh, the moment was, I mean, it was, yeah. I, I think then the sense that, you know, the the, the, the noise, the noise in the, at Lansdowne that day was, oh, it was unbelievable. And the amount of people I've spoke to since, yeah, I was there, you know, half the country was there by all accounts at that game, but... It's the game that's synonymous with Mick McCarthy's reign, that game, definitely. Probably makes living in Dublin, which you do now, that little bit easier. Um, we're going to wind to a halt because of your time, not because mm. of my enthusiasm. But I, um, there's two subjects I want to gently cover. I was going to ask you about how you'd have handled Saipan if you'd been the manager. I don't believe you'd have handled it the same way as I think you, Mick did. Do you know what? Yes, probably it's fair that I probably answer what you're saying. Yes, I, I think... I probably would have handled it differently. I think, but I think it's always better in hindsight as well. But I, I think that I don't know if Mick's ever admitted this or if he even thinks it. But I do think that looking back, he could certainly have managed differently. And it, it, that's not the route I wanted to go down. You know, with Roy there, I've heard you saying, "I feel like we'd have done semi-finals at least." Easy, yeah. And you've used the word, well, you've just used the word easily. Yeah, I think we'd have done. I think we'd have topped our group. I do think that. And again, it's, it's quite bullish when you think about it. I do think well, we're I, top of the group. This is a forum for and your think, opinion. So. Yeah, I think we'd have put Spain out. I think I do think we'd have put Spain out if if, if that had been the case. We should probably we, should, we everybody knows we probably should have anyway. But it's in general, I think we would have. We certainly. So then you there. fancy South Korea? Yeah, I think of course we would have done. We definitely would have done. You've twice said well, once in a previous interview, at least. Yeah. Then you said easily. 
I, I think. What I, do you think that Ireland were, were with Roy Keane and playing the way you played were finalists? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, and again, it's it's you know it, you always look at it. You know, it's everything can change and it runs its course for a reason and all these sort of things. But if I look at how we played and how how much what 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 our collective strengths were and the qualities, individual qualities that we had as well, mixed in with that. We, we 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 should have done. We should have done. Yeah, we should. We said we should have got to the, to the quarters as it is. Yeah, and we should have got to the quarters. And I th- I do feel as though we we would have had a great chance of topping our group originally anyway. And I think as it turns out, it would have ended. We would have ended up playing the Germany in the semi. We played them. I would have fancied us because it simply we, we would have we would have had experience of playing against them in the past. So it's Again, an Ireland Brazil final. Now you made a good case. No, I'm not. I'm not yeah. teasing or mocking. Yeah. You, and you're not doing the Scottish thing about well, no, we've won no. the tournament before you've yeah. even even made it there. You're making a reasonable, a log, a kick, something that's on your mind occasionally. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is. We could have played in a World Cup final yeah. because Korea looked beatable in retrospect against a side that you should have put out Spain. Yes. And Germany, you played in the group, and it was one-one. It was a late goal from Robbie, but yeah. you feel that you had their measure. Yeah, we did. Yeah, I thought throughout yeah, they got an early goal. We conceded early goals against. We conceded a first half goal against uh, Cameroon. We conceded early goal against Germany in the in the second game, and we conceded early goal against Spain as well. We conceded early goals, but we had enough about us. I think it helps in many respects as well that we did concede those early goals because we knew then that we had to maybe play a little bit, yeah. and it certainly helped us. I think it did, and we got ourselves more than back into every one of those games. And then by the last. 20, 30 minutes of every one of those games, we were out playing them. And, and, and I, I thought I detected this feeling about I could have played in the World Cup final in previous interviews that I listened to. Is yeah. that a bugbear? Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, again, we, we, we'd have Kenny Cunningham, would be a regular contributor on our show as well. I listen to him a lot. Well, yeah, and Kenny Beyond. And well, again, when we speak about it, it's, and I mean, it's totally genuine. When we talk about the Saipan incident, we talk about it, it's, just, it's sadness how it all happened I think every single one of us knowing what we know now would have would have done things differently we certainly would have all, all done it differently so, so in a, from a player point of view some of you might have spoken up yeah, or taken the boss definitely. aside or taken Roy aside Most definitely. or something I of that think, order you know if, again it, it's all in hindsight what could you have done differently and I think when we say with Mick, Mick's, Mick feels as though yes he probably in hindsight could have done things differently but in general, I think he feels as though he's right for his ultimate decision that he made. But I think as, as a squad, as a, as, a player, as a group of players together, I think we, w- we would have all done it differently. You know, we were all experienced enough or we had enough experience about us within that squad where we could have actually done something differently. Were yeah. some of them too scared to just say to Roy, it was just, it, it, it take was, a step it, back, I tell you, Roy. looking back at the moment as it was when it was all happening, though, uh, Graham, it, it was just one of those moments where it was, it was between two guys... Going head to head, and and it was just happening in front of our eyes, and it was kind of the, it was almost like you just letting it go in kind many of like respects. Like a bar room, or something. yeah, it, it, it was, was two alpha males going. I'm not backing down. Yeah, it was a bit like that. That's what it was, and it was. You look back at it, and you think it, it, things could have been done differently. Yes, we know that. We know that. It's time to close, but I don't want to close because you're um, a patron and a, and a very articulate man on behalf of um, Down syndrome, yeah. and if it's okay, yeah. I'd like to explain why, because I think that um, a testing moment in your life has turned out to be something uplifting yeah. and, and, and positive. Yeah. And um, you have two daughters, yeah. and your elder daughter is Elsie. Yeah. At, at the mention of her name, you're already beaming. I'm not if you're sure if you're aware yeah. of it or not. <laughs> um, she has Down syndrome, yeah. and, and that was a big test for you as a man, mm. or as a father as a professional footballer mm-hmm. who probably wasn't trained to do anything other than yeah. take this step forward and well, the next not, you, step forward. You can't feel emotionally as a professional footballer, not can allowed. you? Not allowed. No emotion, not apart yeah. from victory emotion, no weaknesses. Yes, yeah. But um, one, tell the people who are listening a little bit about... Yeah, I, I, it's, I think because it's so personal, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot harder to talk about because it is, it is personal, to you, isn't it, when, you, when you're talking around it? So... There, My there, aim is that, that you will change people's appreciation. My aim is yeah. that you will spread the message that yeah, de- oh, Lee Carsley helped you tell to. you about yeah, at the, the time. You, you try to... Uh, Lee and I become very, very close prior to Elsie being born. Now we're, we're like brothers in fairness. But Lee, I said Lee was very influential in me going to Everton. We were, we were together within the Irish setup, so we, 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 would, we were very close. 
you know, great understanding of each other as, as lads first and foremost, become very, very close, very good friends. And Lee's got a son, Connor, with Downs. So Connor has Down syndrome and hadn't met Connor an awful lot. I've met him once or twice at games, but again, his family home was in Birmingham. We would never get the chance to really see each other too much. And then Laura was, Laura was pregnant. My, my ex-wife Laura was pregnant when I went from Sunderland to Everton. And, and then lo and behold, when Laura gives birth, Elsie has Down syndrome. And... I, it was when we were told that Elsie has Elsie has Downs to start with. It was total devastation. What will the world be like? You know, how will she grow? And we we were told a lot of negativity by the doctors. It's a big bugbear with mine as well. I spoke to the midwife afterwards as well. Um, doctors or the medical staff in the communication with parents is something that I spoke about with many other parents as well along the way. The communication, the initial communication, in telling the parents that your child has Downs. It was just a doctor in front of us trying to get facts out, telling us what Elsie might not do. She might not walk. Wow. She might not talk. She might have... In your most vulnerable, exposed moment when you're it not was, ready for... It was incredible. And again, I, and I think back, what, is, is, there an easy, is there an easy way to tell someone that the child has Down syndrome? No, there isn't, and I get that totally. But the paediatrician just wanted to get every single fact out, every single fact out, and then he, he, he handed us a leaflet, put it at the bottom of the bed and just said, have a read of that. It was, it, was, it was basically that. And there was no feeling. There was no... That's very heartless. There was, yeah, very heartless. It's also very term. stupid. Yeah, definitely. Most definitely was. Uh, it's something that I've spoken to the Down Syndrome Association over in the UK, uh, Down Syndrome Ireland, the Down Syndrome Centre here about. And you're speaking to many other parents of, 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 uh, of people with Down Syndrome as well. And in fairness, there's a lot, there's a lot worse stories than, 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 than my story as many well. Many of them recognise your experience. Yeah, definitely. It's a, 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 an agenda at the moment or, or um, something within the Down Syndrome Association. Tell it right. Good. Uh, so the, 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 almost the Down Syndrome Association or people in decent positions are trying to educate the medical staff on how they're actually going to tell it. So the, there is initiatives in place now to try to, to, try to put it right. But... We anyway, we got the news, and again, I go back to the point: is there an easy way to tell it? There, there, there isn't, and I get that totally. But I spoke to the midwife afterwards, and I said, "Look, this is—I'm in a dark moment at the moment. It's not a great time, but how how the doctor explained to us that Elsie's having Downs was wrong, and she said, "Yeah, I totally agree with you. She did. She totally agreed with us. She recognised the position, how vulnerable we probably were at that time when we were told the news. But for all the negativity that we received, for all the the heartlessness, as you say, and I think it's spot on, for all the, the heartlessness that we received initially, I think then we managed to, certainly through Lee, you mentioned Lee earlier on, Lee was actually just recovering from injury at that time. Lee had played a reserve game that night. Lee was due to play a reserve game that night, but I got a message to him that afternoon that Elsie had downs. He ended up scrapping the game. He didn't play, play for the game. He, he came straight across to Macclesfield to see me. And we sat down, we just sat outside the hospital for an hour and the one thing he did say to me at the end of it, he goes, you're in the club now, mate. He just said that to me. And he said, everything will be fine. Don't worry. Everything wow. will be fine. He didn't put any facts or any sort of, he just said, Elsie will be fine. You'll be fine. Don't worry. So showed a bit of love, a bit of reassurance, a bit of yeah. support and left it. Yeah, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't need to go and in, get involved in anything. He didn't need to. He just said, look, she's your daughter. Everything will be fine. That was, a lot, that was the terms that he said, basically. We spoke a little bit about, you know, would have always reverted back to football, spoke a little bit of nonsense for 15, 20 minutes or whatever it was. Uh, yeah, and then he left. Um, but it was, you know, again, it, it, we, we, we are like brothers anyway now. But I think certainly when, when Elsie was born, we became like, unbelievably close. You might have both, both done that if you were factory workers or if you were bus drivers. Exactly. But we're talking about a football community. And I love yeah. that you found that kind of support and, and care uh, within the football community, yeah. which can be a, the football community can, can be <coughs> an absolute sharp pond of yeah. very fragile friendships and support because it's 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 naturally mm. a selfish world, yeah, uh, but not continually so, yeah. And if I'm not wrong, people like Brian Kerr, yeah, uh, did things that mattered to you in the moment. Well, you also found one or two in the dressing room, Davy Weir, yeah, David Moyes, yeah. These I, things. Well, I think I think in general, Elsie was born on a Monday. I think Elsie was born on a Monday. We were due to have a game on the Saturday. You're thinking about games. I, I didn't have, actually think about the game. No, we were playing no, Le no, Leicester no. at the weekend. 
so what happened was then David Moy said to me, look, take as much time, rang me up, just take as much time as you want, no pressure at all on you, just look, just concentrate on yourself at the moment and that's fine. So say Elsie was born on the Monday, I had the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday off, whatever it was. Uh, Elsie uh, then came home, I think on the Thursday, I think it was, she was still quite light, she was only about five, five pounds seven, I think, when she was born and she was on the cusp of, of being too light to, to, to leave and go home. So anyway, we, we ended up then leaving around about the Wednesday, I think it was, the Thursday. And, and then I had David Moyes had rang me up and said, look, what do you think about coming back into training? Um, and I'd spoken to Lee and Lee just said, look, Kev, take, take a few weeks off. I thought about it. I spoke to Laura, my wife at the time, and I just said, look, we'll go in. I'll go in. I'll try it anyway. But I was still very, very emotional, very, very raw. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't have gone in on that Friday. The team were preparing for a game. And I... I arrived in the training ground and I just, um, we had a lad who was on the gate, who uh, was the old Belfield training ground. As I arrived in the training ground, um, wound down my window, how you doing, had the, the various chat and he said, oh, things, everything all right, I believe you had a, you had a baby, yeah, give me the usual chat, yeah. and don't worry, they're, they're loving kids. It wasn't what I wanted to hear at all at that moment, it wasn't what I wanted to hear. So anyway, I just drove in and I sat in my car I cried on my own in the car, in the car park at Belfield, sat for about 15, 20 minutes, dried my eyes, got myself together, got a bit of composure and then went into the changing room, went into the dressing room. And the first person I met was Kevin Campbell. And Kev, like, love Kev. Like, Kev was just like such a, a great character to be around. He, he, just, he had so much warmth about him. He just gave me a big hug. He just said, congratulations, killer. All the best. And then... That was it, really. David Weir, who you mentioned, Alan Stubbs, Duncan Ferguson. You know, these are huge characters. Lee Carsley, Steve Watson, Gary Naismith. Big, big characters. Nigel Martin. Brilliant players, but also big, big characters. And, you know, they, they give me the warmth that I probably needed that day. They recognised I was probably I was very, very vulnerable at that time. And I went up training that day. And I don't remember too much about training. I remember going, we would, I didn't really train with the first team. I did a bit with, with Taff, Andy Holden around the back. Did a bit of shooting with Franny Jeffers and I think Duncan as well. And just remember, everything was wrong. It just, I, I shouldn't have been there. But in many respects, it helped me because I went up to see David Moyes as well. I think it was after training. David Moyes spoke to me. He said, look, just get your head together. Come back in next week, whatever it would be. But I think by, a, by going into training that day, I think it helped it helped everything else going forward. When I did go back into training on the Monday, I got it out of the way. That would have been another weekend the to think about The longer you wait to start yeah. when you're in pain, the harder it is to yeah, start. Yeah, definitely. It was the right decision, I think, looking back. Um, but we had an international coming up the... I think it might have been the, the two weeks after. So it would have been... Say I went back in the train on the Monday. I think we had an international a week that Tuesday. And Brian Kerr was on the phone. Brian rang me. Um, Brian, again, was another one take as much time as you want you come in and join up you want I want you in the squad you should come in and join up with the squad I know what it means to you to play for us you should come in and join with us but take as much time as you want you come in the day before do whatever you need to do and I said look I rang him up that following week and I said look I said I'll maybe the team I think we're meeting up on the Sunday I said just give me till the Monday he said fine no worries meet on the, the Monday we've got the game Wednesday just get yourself in great no no worry I think we'll play the Czechs actually and uh, but Brian just Brian just told me I'm there for you. That's that was basically it. He didn't need to he didn't need to say too much. Um I I think as a man first and foremost with him, I I can't speak highly enough of him for what he did to me personally, how much time he gave to me, how much time he gave me on a personal basis by speaking to me as well when I come in. Everything alright, what can I do for you? Um you know, anything anything at all you need, I'm there for you. Basically saying that. And again, it was it was things that maybe went over my head at the time, but it was what I needed to hear. It was what I needed to hear, and it's, and it's just that basically it was on my side. And again, coming in with a squad here, the likes of Shea, Robbie Harty, all these lads that were around the squad at that time, just great, great, great friends, essentially. And that's all it was. That's all I needed, really. And then... It become easier and easier, of course, and then be, as time goes on, then I got involved with the Down Syndrome Association and, and all these sort of things. But I think the, the love and support that I received from teammates around that initial two weeks, uh, it went a long way. And that's probably why I'd still class a lot of those lads who I've mentioned there as, as friends. It's heartwarming um, to hear that that's the case um, from an industry which is often decried. And the way I want to finish, because it seems to me a really important part of your life, was, was Lee more or less right for all the difficulties that you and Elsie and her sister and her mum have encountered? Mm. Was he more or less right in saying it'll be okay? Yeah, 
Well, he was, he was spot on with it'll be okay. Yeah, Elsie's had her problems. She has she she does have hearing problems. She has a little bit of, of sight trouble, but she wears her glasses. She's had grommet. She's been in and out of hospital and things like that at times. But that's what most uh, families who have a child with Down syndrome have encountered along the way. Um, she's a stubborn little one at times. She's um, she's getting a great personality now. She gets older. She's thirteen now. And she is. She's just an amazing little girl alongside her sister. The two of them, Isla and Elsie, they're just great girls. It's, I think Elsie being Elsie has certainly helped Isla. I think Isla now is just becoming just this amazing little girl off the back of it, an amazing sister to her. And I think in general, the two of them are just becoming or growing into great women. So I, I couldn't be prouder of the pair of them, yeah. Um, what a fantastic thing to be able to say as a father. What a good way to end an interview with uh, a guy who I think has shown what I originally wanted to show, your depth of character, you're a good man, somebody who's made the most of his talents, um, even if those talents might have taken you, I don't know, to Liverpool or further yeah. or, or whatever. I think a family level. I think that's what it is, yeah. It's not what people <laughs> tell me, that there was, uh, there was greater ability than people um, realised. The Champions League would have benefited from having you there. And aside from just this sounding a bit gushing, I think we've talked to somebody who's been a great representative of football, and I think it's shown in this chat. And also, it's been fun. You made me laugh. To be a successful footballer, to be a successful journalist that you've trained for, and to be a dad who loves his kids and is proud of them. So far, that ain't bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. That ain't bad. Thank you to Kev Cobain for being such a great guest. Plus a proper supporter of the big interview, but also huge thanks to our friends at News Talk for allowing us to use their luxurious Hollywood-style studios. Christy Callaghan, you drove us to this interview, and in your downtime, you were reading Kev Coban's autobiography. This is for you, you rugby fiend, you. But also thanks to all of you socios for continuing to support us. You know already we couldn't do it without you. Tell your friends, tell your families... It's a cut of quid a month. They need to become socios now.